We're on. Today's guest, we've got Nick Dunn. First of all, Nick, I just want to say thanks for coming on the show. Yes, thank um, you for coming. You've got a bit of a story, mate, from a war hero to getting falsely accused of a crime in India, where you spent four years of your life, which eventually got quashed. Um, it's a very interesting story. It's a crazy story also, because it's also... Well, spending four years in India for something that you didn't do is, is heartbreaking. Um, but... We'll go right back to the start with you, mate, and where you grew up and stuff, and how you get into the paratroopers. Um, yeah, uh, grew up in Ashton, Northumberland, in the northeast of England. Um, when you're a kid, you go down the woods and you play armies, make camp. So I always, as a young age, felt the army was my destination from actually leaving school and. You go, you see, you see Arnold Schwarzenegger films, and you and you think, I want to be that, and. Uh, I joined the army at the age of 18 uh, and I went to join the parachute regiment and I spent six years with one para uh, in special force support group working alongside UKSF and going on operations in Iraq, Afghanistan and Northern Ireland um, was quite an experience for me. Um, and I've met some fantastic guys along the way. And I, I felt that I wanted to do a lot more in the army. However, you got the private security um, and mainly maritime that was creeping up. And a lot of the guys that I served with went into that line of work. And it was just a, a matter of time when I was going to do that leap and go into private security and my chosen field was maritime and I left the army in 2010 and I started maritime in 2012 so obviously I was during that time basically getting my qualifications and it was quite a harrowing experience being in the army since the age of 18 and leaving at the age of 24 I was kind of kind of stuck on what to do and the way of life so Getting used to civilian life was, was that quite more hard. freedom. Um, the transition from being in the paratroopers to be more regimented, more structured, to becoming a guard. Oh and yes, definitely, definitely. I, I felt I couldn't just go into a normal civilian role job, like say working in an office, because that's not me. I felt like I always wanted to protect something, and being in the army, you know, you you learn to to do stuff like that, and. Being in maritime, your sole job is protecting the ship cargo and the crew, and I enjoy doing it. Is that from like the pirates and stuff like that? Yeah, trying yeah. to hijack the ship? Yes, definitely. If you came across uh, pirates, um, whether it be the Indian Ocean, Arab, Arabian Sea, or in the Red Sea, um, you've you've just got to you know do your job to the best you can. Yeah, when you were in the paras, Nick, you get blew up, did you not? Yes, in Afghanistan, me and two of us, we uh, were in a, a, a Wimmick Land Rover and um, we drove over a pressure plate mine which went up the engine block. It was quite a, a nerve-wracking experience. Yes, we were all fine, but it just, you know, when you hear, when you, you've seen people being injured and they've lost an arm and a leg or if not a lot more, that split second you can't do nothing and I'm very grateful that it was just a pressure plate of mine because no far, no far to the right of our vehicle there was an anti-tank mine which was identified and that would have wiped us out. Yeah, and that would have been scary. Do you think that was one of the reasons why you wanted to make the transition as well? Is Listen, it's not exactly any safer um, garden ships but do you think you wanted out a bit more because obviously... No, not really. I just It was just a lot of people that when I joined the the battalion and everyone that I kind of knew, got friends with, they were jumping ship onto ships, so to speak, going to maritime, going to Iraq, doing their CP, close protection. So I thought I'll, I'll do both courses and see which I get to do first. And maritime was obviously my uh star and role so to speak mm -hmm. so what is maritime what is that explain that about nick um basically you, you you you'll go from say the uk you'll possibly fly to say uh sri lanka um you'll board a ship 
and you'll guard that ship. Say that ship goes up to Muscat in the Oman. You will literally guard that vessel. Sometimes you can be unarmed, but majority of the time, because of the threat is real, they will have weapons. Um, so you will have be an armed guard, just basically making sure that vessel goes from A to B in the safest mm -hmm. uh, manner. Well, you made world headline news. Um, obviously, the Chennai Six where. Six years, well, at 30 years, the, the ship got, the police came onto the ship, they found guns and ammunition. Um, you get took to prison. How was that experience when they first came on the boat? Um, it was quite a strange experience because it happened in the early hours of uh, the 12th of October 2013 and the... Tactical deployment officer informed us that we were being escorted um, to the port of Tuta Karin. Um, mind the vessel that we were on was the a company who I worked for was like floating armory uh, ship. So basically, you had kit and equipment, and when you came off a normal client vessel, you sometimes went onto these vessels. So it wasn't an actual client vessel that they boarded and brought to port it was the company's own vessel because i believe they were tipped off that we were potentially doing something illegal which we weren't um and we were brought to the port of tuta Karin at a very slow speed mind we were only so many nautical miles away and it shouldn't have taken that long however getting close to the port of tuta Karin, we had a massive welcome committee of every naval, you know, organization, police organization from up and down the, the country of India to welcome us to say what we've been up to, apparently. So it was guns and ammunition. Was it 30 guns and 6,000 ammunition? Was 35 weapons. Um, funny enough, there was 35 personnel on that vessel. Only 25 could legally use them weapons because they were the amount of guards. So do you have a license for those weapons? Um, there is like export licenses for the weapons. They're not licenses such as just basically from the, you know, the uh, company in say the UK, Malta, etc. They would say, right, these weapons are for the sole purpose of maritime. So they're not necessarily a license because that means every weapon would have a single license and then we would... You've got a weapons competency uh, certificate, so it, it makes you enable to use these weapons if for maritime. Be. So did you just know the the weapons and the ammunition was on the ship? Oh, yeah, definitely. We it, we were not operating. We were waiting to take fuel and ammunition. Mm -hmm. So all the weapons, the kit, ammunition was stored, locked away, and there's only two people that could have access to that uh, room. One was the captain, obviously, and the tactile, tactile deployment officer, which uh, he would have a key as well. So when the police came on the boat, and then eventually that's what he's get charged, charged with, you must have thought at that time then everything's fine. Because oh, yeah, d definitely. We obviously have to show the kit and equipment and the weapons and the ammunition to the police, to the Coast Guard, to anyone. Even when you're on a client vessel, if you have to go to a port of call, you've got them locked, you've got them sealed, stamped, signatures, whatever. You show the police, this is our weapons for armed security. And they go, yes, no problem. So you showed, you've showed those weapons and ammunition before, but yet when the boat get raided, they oh, jailed they, you that time? They just said, we found weapons. And that was it? Yeah, that, that was the beginning of a night, four-year nightmare. So... This is when the nightmare obviously began, when you were fighting for your freedom, because the maximum sentence you could have got up to 10 years. I believe between seven and 10 years, but we uh, we got five years um, initially. And how was the foreign office and stuff? Were they backing you? Were they helping you? The foreign office, my personal take on it, they did as much as they physically could. I think during the early stages of the four years, they were quite apprehensive. They wanted to physically know, had we done anything wrong? We hadn't done anything wrong. Six of the weapons that they said were illegal, 
mind were in Mumbai one month previously, so if they were going to be illegal, they would have been stopped then. Them said weapons were, they had the export document licenses from BIS, which is a UK government organisation, yet the Indian authority said that them weapons don't count for jack outside the UK. So you had the license from the UK to say that you were carrying those weapons and everything was legal above board? Practically, so, yes. So what prison did you go to the very first night? Uh, when we got arrested off the vessel on the 18th of October, mind so we got arrested on the, uh, we brought to the port on the 12th of October. We spent It took six days for them to remove us. Mind they didn't say you were under arrest, suspicion of, they said, we're taking you to hospital for checkup. We never went to the hospital. We went to a police station. We spent all day on the 18th. No food, no very little water, sweating. There was no legal representation for us. There was no, you know, no one from the British Embassy to see we. We were literally on our own, being shouted and screamed at in Tamil. Sign this or we'll ruin your life. Sign what? It's a blank piece of paper. I'm not signing nothing. So Was that trying to get a confession or try to sign? I don't know what they were trying, but they honestly believed they were onto something and they, it, took, it took four years for them to realise you, you were just digging a hole for yourself. Did you ever think you were getting out at one point? Uh, Do you ever think, I'm fucked, I'm here for good? Because it's no, a kind of set up. No, I, n- I never once l- allowed my mental state to say, that's it, I'm going to be spending a long, 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 long time. I knew I would come home to my family. I knew justice will prevail eventually. It's just a matter of how long. Um, leading up to the trial and we actually getting convicted for the five years, I spent quite a long time, a year and a half, with out of prison, which you think, how can this be? I've got no charges, yet you won't allow me to go home. Did they take your passport and stuff off you? They took our passport off us. They basically, ineffectively said we were under country house arrest, but we weren't. We literally had no charges. So you can imagine spending that length of time from, say, April 2014 to September 2015. That's a, a long time having to try and survive in a mm-hmm. country where it's not your home. You're going to miss your family every single day, that little bit more as the months and year goes by. And it, you got to look at the financial strain. Yes, we had amazing support from the F- British Legion, and uh, the mission to save fares, they helped us out financially, and I'd like to say thank you to them. But my family still has to, you know, pay as well. And when you're not earning, mm-hmm. it, it mounts up and mounts up. Because you spoke earlier, it's your freedom, it's your time. And one of the last times you spoke to your mum as well was when you actually got the, the, the first day in prison over there. Yeah, uh, well... The last time I was able to speak to me, ma'am, properly before she had a double aneurysm was the morning of us getting arrested and removed off the vessel. And it's quite a heartbreaking um, time for me because, you know, I'll admit I'm a mammy's boy. And, you know, to tell you, no child wants to ever tell their parents that I'm getting arrested in a foreign country. I don't know when I'll next be able to speak to you. So you can imagine how my family felt yeah. once me telling them that. Do you have a lot of, you must have a lot of anger then towards the Indian government and the way that you've been treated? Anger, anger, yes, but no, not really. I think, yeah, I am angry at why they continued to pursue it when the new... They had nothing against us. I'm angry that they'd done that. They could have let it go in April, uh, sorry, July 2014. If they didn't have put an appeal in, after the 90 days, it would have been over. 
no one would have batted any eyelids. I would have gone, wife, bloody hell. And I probably would have ended up carrying on doing maritime, but for them to put a, an appeal in to the Supreme Court on day 88, that was just, it made it more personal, I think. Yeah, fuck, especially if you think you're getting away with it then. It was, you, you never did anything to get away with, but if you creep them up to 87, 88, you're thinking, okay, it's done, I can time, time to go home, time to go back to work, see my family. And then when they put in the appeal, how long after the appeal did you go to court? And you got your five-year sentence? September. That's when, September, the following year, that's when the trial began. And going through the trial, what were you think to yourself? They've not got anything here or I'm fucked? Well, turning up a trial was up. Uh, it wasn't mandatory. It was optional on certain days unless the judge required. So I'd been a few times and I wasn't prepared to keep spending time, nine, like nine and a half hours to... Uh, travel down to court so I, I just used to say look I'm not coming tell me when I've physically got to be there and I'll be there and when I went on a few occasions I felt absolutely sick to my stomach when our lawyer would translate what say you know when someone goes in the witness stand and the, our lawyers are cross, cross reference and stuff it was disgusting Absolutely disgusting hearing the lies from the Indian police. And how many people got charged then? 35. And 35 all get five years each? Yes. 35 people? Do you think there's a lot of corruption then in India? Do you think that's because the people who get the jail? I had a man on my show called James Toner as well, and he was set up by the police with drugs, and he spent four years in prison, actually two years in prison, and I think he was on bail for two years, but you're waiting we, there anyway. We, I, I think that is the same case that our embassy spoke to us about. They, they mentioned that person, mm -hmm. and we have obviously fell foul to the uh, corruption of India. Because definitely. they make money from every prisoner they get. Oh, yes, Fox, definitely. Yeah. In, in it, it was in the papers on telly in India, basically they were saying... You know, we will arrest anyone if we believe they are committing a crime. It's about putting the numbers behind the bar, behind bars, not actually doing police work and saying, well, you are guilty, you're going to prison. It was, you're going to prison. It's all about a numbers game to them. So when you got the five years, how was the prison you were in then? Uh, the prison, Central Prison 1 in Puzal, uh, Chennai, was a very basic basic prison like a big we were in a big room with you know a few you know, brick shelves and a hole in the floors of water where we'd use a bucket to flush away and then use that area potentially for washing and it was just when you look at the bars on the windows and then that time where it comes to locking up at say six o'clock at night, and that type, that noise the door makes, it sends shivers down your spine because that's when the reality hits in that you're in a prison in a foreign country. And when am I coming home? How many people were in your cell? Initially, there was twenty three were in one cell, and it became very cramped. People, as you know, have got different hygiene uh, issues and some people are going to start arguing, especially when you've got three different nationalities. You've got Estonians, Ukrainians and uh, British all in one cell. And it did come to a point where the prison gave us two more cells so we could split ourselves yeah. down. So all the foreigners were in one cell? Um initially and then even they got sick of each other so they, they that's where the third cell came to for a few of their guys so um majority of the british were downstairs from the main cell that were yeah. initially put in because i know your sister lisa fought a lot for your freedom she was everywhere doing news reports and um fighting a lot trying to raise money as well to try and basically keep us alive over there do you think it wasn't for her you could still potentially be over there um no she did what any family member would do for their loved ones. You know, mind a lot of the other families didn't do a lot of media and that 
fully respect their wishes on that. But my sister made a pledge that she would do everything that she physically could to make the government aware uh, injustice was being served and she wanted to basically raise so much awareness that everyone would start pointing fingers at India and saying, release these innocent men. So, yeah, I, I'm very grateful for what my sister's done, but it was, at the end of the day, a dying man who ended up uh, making way for our freedom. But, what happened there? Well, the Ukrainian uh, captain of the vessel, he got bone cancer. And he was a bit of a, a, a you know, a playmaker. So he was always going, I'm dying, I'm dying. So the Indians never took him seriously. And he kind of was really bad. He was sick. And he had bone cancer and basically his case was going through the courts while we were still waiting on a decision at high court. He up, uh, he obviously got his case heard at Supreme Court off the grandest judge of the whole of India and that's what got us off our freedom. When you got your freedom, how was that feeling? Uh, I remember to this day and I'll remember for the rest of my life it was the 27th of November 2017 on a Monday. The night before, I know it sounds corny, cheesy, whatever, but the song, The Final Countdown, came on that radio and I said to the lads in the cell, I said, that's it, it's over tomorrow. And they were always quite apprehensive. Oh, we'll see. I said, no, no, it's over. We are getting the decision tomorrow. I don't care. It's happening and we will be home for Christmas. That's how positive I was. And a lot of them didn't like that because they just wanted mm, quite apprehensive. Fair play to them. Maybe I was masking my my apprehensiveness, but I felt positive. I felt confident something good was going to happen. And you can imagine no one got sleep that night. So all day you're waiting. Oh, we're going to hear news. We're going to hear news. And we were obviously the last case, I think, 40-odd cases. Surprise, surprise. The last to get heard. And I was outside in my little makeshift gym, and I remember uh, Paul Towers coming to the uh, bars, and he, he shouted, Dunny, Dunny. I went, what? And you could hear it in his voice. It was a mixture of tears and happiness rolled into one. And he says, that's it. Cases are quitted. It's over. And I was just buzzing. Mm. I said, I told you, I told you, you know, and I, I, I went back to my workout and I, I went, I can't do it. My, my head was just flown yeah, with so much, emo so much emotion and uh, great feeling. Yeah, and that me. was just before Christmas? Uh, that was just before Christmas. The next day was the day we literally got brought out of prison, which has never ha happened in their court before. Normally you've got to wait for the court order. Basically, the judge is going, get them out now. So the next day, obviously, you're, you're still on a high, you know, you, so you never slept again. So there's two nights with no sleep. And I had to get out that cell and I started training just to try and tire myself out. And I was walking around the compound. Paul's obviously been summoned to the superintendents and he's came back. And as I've come round, he's come in through the compound gate. I said, what's going on? He says, pack your bags. The embassy's coming at 11. And my knees buckled. And my knees buckled and it was the, an amazing feeling, absolute an amazing feeling to be told, not just it's over, but you're getting out of that shithole. You're leaving prison. And packed, obviously everyone was packing that stuff. I was like, well, I'll just wait because... I know things don't go smoothly in India. They, they say five minutes, an hour later, still not. So I was just playing, playing it cool, me. I was just, I oh, will get me stuff down. Everyone was down at the main office where the superintendent, and they came in, the embassies here. We had the deputy high commissioner, the, de uh, the high commissioner, and the two embassy girls that came, and it was real 
real nice feeling seeing them with their vehicles for you to leave and we went from the prison to the embassy in Chennai and obviously I rung my sister and I said it's me and she went who's this I went it's me I'm out and obviously she was buzzing and she went I'm on my way to Newcastle airport I'm coming to get you it was just mad mad feeling how were you treated when you got home oh well obviously it is on online to say that the the day of my arrival in in Newcastle airport on the 7th of December 2017 blew my mind not even my family was expecting all of that to be there but to come home you, you could say it was like to, a hero's welcome of some sort and I, I was thinking I wasn't a hero I was just a, a guy from Ashington doing a job I enjoyed doing and this could have easily happened to someone else but to have a fantastic support from the northeast parts of England and different countries of the world it was really really fantastic to know people cared for our mistreated you know time in India and far from the bottom of my heart I'll always say thank you to those people you can tell your emotion emotions and ever running high does that bring back then a lot of emotion speaking about it I'm all I'm okay for talk yes yeah, there's always going to be emotions it was an emotional four years of a roller coaster ride for me and my family but I believe for my own mental health, I have to talk about it because mm -hmm. anyone who knows me, if I keep it in, I'll probably blow a gasket. And that's when you're not in control of your mental still, mental health. And I don't want to be one of those people who end up losing control. I would run it, try and control my channel emotions it. and channel it. And, you know... Speak, I refer back to the past to see how far I've come in the future. That's the only time I look back and talking about what happened is good for me. Yes, I do get a bit emotional at times on certain subjects, but... Which isn't a bad thing, by the way. It's not a bad thing, but it helps me deal with the mental aspects mm -hmm. of day-to-day -day living now. Uh, how, is, uh, how have you coped now back into normal society, background... A well, well, you can imagine my first week. I remember uh, uh, it's people don't understand the day to day uh, house appliances, and I remember putting a load of washing. Mine, I've been spending four years of putting my washing in a bucket and hand washing. So when I've looked at, and I've put a load of, in the washing machine and I've looked at the washing machine and I've gone, "How the hell do you work this?" <laughs> so I was on the phone. How do you work your washing machine? He go turn it to the right once, press start. I went, all right, cheers. Putting that kettle on, not having to put it over a stove. Hot water, having a bath. I hadn't had a bath in four years. Had cold showers and bucket showers in the prison. You know, it was a mad... Sounds like torture. It, it was mad, you know, sitting on a toilet. I know people will never experience having to squat over a hole and then having to flush... You know, that's yes. what medieval times are. That it is. That is medieval. I said, and I've always said, right? If our prisons in the UK were back, well, like the prisons in India, I tell you what, they'll be nearly empty, and that's a guaranteed fact. They'll not be Mister Hard Guy in our our prisons. You know, luxury playstations, TVs, free meals food, a day, cooked for you. Gym. We, we had to cook our own food. We had to cook our own food. Mm -hmm. So do you think going through that process as well, even though it was as barbaric, what obviously you went through, especially when you were... So, after, sorry, I'm jumping here, um, but fine. did the case get acquitted? Did they get quashed? Did they get threw out? Or did you uh, get... The whole timeline is April 2014, we got bail, signing twice a day at the police station. July 2014, the case got quashed. So our charges were dropped. The captain and all that for the fuel and all that was still ongoing. 
90 days to appeal. The British government should have gotten us home, especially when we've shown Indian law that we don't need to be, co- be in the country during that 90 day period. They appealed, th- there you go. So, come once we've been sentenced to five years and then we won our appeal, mind we had an appeal, the judgment, it was acquitted of all charges. It wasn't, we were all thinking potentially time served. Time served means you've beat your guilty, but they're just cutting your time short. Because I don't believe, I, I believed, we all believed that the Indians, they wanted some sort of victory because it was a lot of pressure in, in the later stages of the whole From case. The media. From media, the UK government did up their, uh, you know, stance on things. Um, we were going to get a killy time. So to get an acquittal, that means we've been wrongly imprisoned, wrongly convicted. And many people have been asking, have I been getting compensation? No, I don't. I'm getting compensation or anything. So you haven't had compensation from India, the vessel you're working on, the UK government? Nothing. Absolute nothing. Yes, you can't put a price on stuff like that, but I tell you what, if it was anywhere else in the world, someone would have handed that person compensation. You've got to take into consideration the mental aspect of losing four years innocently of your life. You know, the mental... I haven't earned in four years... Having to be in prison while getting told your mum's fine for her life, you know. How how do you compensate stuff like mm-hmm. that? But I've got my freedom, and you can't put a price on freedom. Yeah, and that's the most important thing. I'd still be serving my five year sentence this day if we didn't win our appeal. It was just scary to think. It's fucking real scary, yeah. That's how I... If someone said to me five years ago, right, something bad's going to happen in your life. Do you want to do seven and a half years? Because that's what it would prob- That's what it would have been in total. Or four years. What would you want to take? Seven and a half or four years? I'll take the four years all day long. Mm-hmm. Mind it shouldn't have happened. But at the beginning, you don't know what's going on because everything's up in the air. But... It was set. It was a setup. We were set up by our agent. Simple as that. Because he's got money then. Yes. To set you up and give yeah, you yes. time to, especially the amount of money that the company paid him to organise the fuel and provisions. And when you're in a court of law and you've got the paperwork on how much is actually being spent, I think he's bought himself. And but why? What's the agenda on doing that? I have no idea. It's no idea. Yeah, it's definitely still a lot of questions that need answered as well. And especially, have you ever had an apology from anyone? No, I've never even had the company owner, Samir Faliala, ring me or email me personally to say, look, I'm sorry on that time of your life that's to be taken away from you. We got out of prison and he put something online saying basically bigging himself up yeah we got the guys free this that and you and i'm thinking taking credit for it yeah basically taking credit for it he's not bothered he doesn't care mm-hmm. he just left us to rot basically yes um this is one of the reasons why you're on this show today because you have listen you're a war hero what you've done in some places is you're a hero to some people and and then giving away, to getting four years of your life took away, well, seven and a half years. One of the reasons why you're on here today is you want to release a book also. So for anybody watching or listening, um, get involved with Nick, contact Nick. How can people contact you, Nick? Um, I'm on Twitter, um, I'm on Instagram, and also I'm on Facebook. Yeah, so Nick Dunn. Nick Dunn, easy. I'm sure people can find yeah. us. I'm not hard, I don't have the privacy settings yeah. so i'm i am easily found and yeah it, it, i i there because is what a, you've says here is is you've not even scratched the surface i haven't scratched the surface people people have said um yeah it's been in the media but it's just 
a tip of the iceberg for me to discuss four years <laughs> is a long journey because a lot happened mm. in four years and a saying lot out of prison. Y- y- yes everything you know i was attacked by the police whilst i was out of prison i witnessed prisoners getting beat with sticks off the guards in prison i, I witnessed a total different kind of life in india and it is a total different kind of life compared to we here in the UK. So when people whinge and moan about how life can be tough in this country, they need to have a look at what life in India is. A reality check. And a, a big reality yeah, check. Because we do live in luxury here, but it's because we're so used to it. Used to it. We want more. We I crave appreciate more. Yeah. the finer things in life. Mm-hmm. I appreciate what it means to have freedom. Mm-hmm. I know what that means a lot more than a lot of people. Yeah, and it's the most valuable currency. And I know you're, you've not had compensation and I know um, money will not bring back your time, but I think you fucking earned it. I think you deserve some sort of apology or some somebody from something to say, look, we're sorry. We're sorry that you've, we've caused you destruction in your life inside the prison and out and the worry because when you you're doing that sentence you're not just doing the sentence yourself your family are doing it with you oh the 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 definitely the definitely uh said they were living the nightmare with me but i was in the prison doing the worst of it um just he has has another thing i sat across the desk of the woman destroying our life I showed her pictures of my mum in hospital. I showed her letters from our lawyer stating we should be allowed legally by Indian law to go home. And she didn't even look at them. She says, let's see what happened in court. And I replied to her in a civil manner because what's the point? I'm in a police head court, police headquarters. Yeah. There's no point kicking off there. You get more added on your sentence. Exactly. I said... But you can tell the prosecutor you're dropping it. You can end it now. But she didn't. She turned around and said, let the court decide. And then it just spiraled, carried spiraled on. and carried on. So going forward for yourself for the future, what's your, what, what's your plans? Oh, well, I'm just doing UK security. Uh, I'm enjoying... You know, being back in work and earning money, having a life. Um, obviously, I would like to get a book done. Um, hopefully, things can materialise with that. I just want to... I've had so many people say to me, you've got an interesting story. I would love to read about that in my own time, so to speak. Are you ever going to do... Are you going to do a book? And I thought, well, why not? Why not do a book? You know, people say, yeah, I've got a fantastic story, but that's not... That's, Let's tell that story, and I'm willing to do that. Um, I just want to be back to me myself. You know, I enjoy just you know living Training, my life. You still keep yourself fit. You're in good shape, man. Well, I spent a lot of time in India. You know, you got a year and a half. I was eating biryani, which is chicken <laughs> and rice, nearly every day, four times a day. It only cost a quid, really, but eating that, I was going to the gym. Going in prison, me and the Estonians and all that, we, we made our own little homemade prison. So you've got to set goals, you've got to try and keep yourself mentally stable. And I've always like and I have always thought fitness as a way of keeping yourself. Do you think sane. that balanced your yeah, the demons out and the pain and the misery that the Indian justice system are doing to you? Oh yes. Definitely. Because you made your own gym in the we gym. We made our correct? own gym. We used to run around. I did my own Great North Run, the Chennai Half Marathon in prison. On the same day, the morning of, you know, when my sister ran it. Um, it was just one of those ways of battling and dealing with things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know take, what I mean? Kind of taking the pain away. Are you still in contact with any of the boys you got um, to prison with? I can, uh, yeah, I still speak to one or two of them. You know, everyone's got back to their own life and I don't blame them on that. We only came together through all being arrested together, you know. People got on with others. People hated each other's guts. Hey, 
and I, I mean this, you could have put two lifelong best friends in that present together. They wouldn't be friends after the, afterwards. I tell you that it made or break people that prison. It did. And I can turn around and say, yes, I met some great people, but it destroyed a lot of people mentally, I think, that prison because of the fact you're innocent. That's the main thing. Because you know you are innocent, you've done nothing wrong, and your life's been taken away from you, your freedom. That's what I think was very mentally challenging on everyone. Yeah, because you don't know with the justice system over there, it's not like the UK one. You're, you're kind of in the know, you know what's happening. Over there, you get took to court and buses and public transport. and Oh, sometimes you, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, and that's the scary part, not being in control of your own freedom, especially if you are innocent and then yeah. eventually getting acquitted. But again, Nick, you've got some story and I hope people jump on it and, and try and help you out to get your book released. And I hope you get an apology from someone you nah. at least deserve a fucking apology because to spend seven and a half years of your life after spending six years of your life fighting for your country and and not having any apology from anybody, do you think the UK government sh should be doing a bit more for you? Um, I'm not too sure on, on their policies on doing that. It's only taken them so many years just to try and accept that there's a, you know, people with mental health support in veterans or they've just acknowledged that. Um, I think they need to do a lot more stance on people leaving the military um, and stop trying to send people to prison for something that happened 30-odd, 50-odd year ago and stuff like that. But n my circumstances, I think they could have gone, right, we will try and use our lawyers in India and try and fight for your compensation. You know, if the government turned around and said that to me, I would have gone, great, crack on. Mm. But they haven't. And do I do I blame them on that? No, I don't, because that's the government for you, to be honest. Yeah. But again, Nick, for coming on today and telling your story, and it's a crack story, mate, even though I know obviously you went through, but for people listening, they will enjoy it because they love the dark stuff and... But again, you've come out, you're back on your feet, you're doing well again, you're trying to move forward and progress instead of living in the past. But I hope for people watching again to get involved, you contact Nick. Um, he's want to get his book out there, he's wanting his story heard. So again, do you, do you want to say anything before we wrap up? Um, just, just thank yous. You know, I did mention to the mission to the seafarers, thank you for your support. Uh, the British Legion, thank you for your support. The Embassy in Chennai, thanks for your support. Jordan Wiley, thanks for your support. For the He came over to Chennai and did a 10k run to raise money and awareness for us, so thanks for that. Um, thanks to uh, an amazing family. My sister has shown tremendous support. And most importantly, the people who... Look, overlooked things and gone he's not a mercenary he's not guilty he's just a person earning a living just like myself wrongfully arrested you know I'm going to support him and a lot of people supported us Lisa used to send me statuses from say Facebook people's lovely comments and I used to read that in my prison cell and read people's nice kind comments and that gave me energy, mm -hmm. mental willpower to fight the, the next yeah. day and them days beyond. If it wasn't for people's support, I think I would have struggled a lot, lot more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks for everybody's support because even those wee kind messages, they can spur you on to fight even more because people have got behind you. But, Nick, everything for the future, brother. I wish you all the best. Right, thank you very thanks much. Thanks for coming on and telling yes. your story, mate. I really yes, appreciate thank it. Thank you.